Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your life coach, mentor coach. And what I do is I help people that are tired of who they are and where they are in life. And this is Gloria, your life coach. I help those who are feeling stuck, struggling with difficulties such as self-doubt, inner judgment, lack of confidence, life transitions, and taking steps forward. And welcome to Life's A Shuffle podcast. Now, you may wonder why it's called Life's A Shuffle. And the reason why we came up with this title was that life is really shuffling. And it doesn't matter where you come from, your background, what age you are, you're shuffling multiple things in life. And the best thing to know in life is everybody faces your struggles and everybody faces what you're going through. But there's hope in learning something about that. So when our guests share their journey, the hope is you learn something in that journey so yourself can navigate the struggles you face, the low self-esteem, the self-confidence. And that's why we call podcast Life's a Shuffle. And throughout this podcast, we share our personal overcoming stories, as well as our guests who shares their personal journey in overcoming their personal struggles. Life's a Shuffle podcast is here to connect like-minded individuals. And thank you for listening to Life's a Shuffle podcast. Hi, this is Gloria, life coach and meditation coach. Welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Hi, this is Ron Johnson, life coach and mindfulness coach. And welcome to the episode of Life's a Shuffle. And today we have a special guest. Um, coming all the way from the East Coast, and she's here to share her story about who she is and what her tri- triumphs are and how she has lived a better life for herself. Uh, so, Jesse Lucas, welcome to the Life's a Shuffle podcast, and you know, tell our listeners uh, who you are, where you're from, and what you do. Absolutely. Um, well, hi, Gloria. Hi, Ron. Thank you. And yes, I am coming to you from New York State. And, uh, but I'm, I'm not a New Yorker. I have to kind of say that I'm a mid Atlantic girl. I'm from the, the Maryland suburbs of, of Washington, DC and any Marylanders, uh, who are listening. No, you can take a girl out of Maryland, but you cannot take the Maryland out of a girl. We are very <laughs> proud of our, of ourselves. Um, but so I, I run a business called embodied movement training in my background. I've been a yoga teacher and a personal trainer for going on 20 years. I've done some hands-on body work in there, taught lots of different things. And it's really been my only career path. I know a lot of people in the, the movement space kind of uh, started as a side gig or come to it from another career. And I actually started this career as a self-care move when I was in my young 20s. I was a young mom and I started a family <clears throat> before I started a career. I was pregnant with my first kiddo right out of college. And I had the opportunity at that point to just be a mom, be at home with with my baby, which was ha- it was good for me. I was happy, happy about that, but it didn't take me very long to realize that I was kind of losing myself to to really entering motherhood at such a young age and not having started kind of my own adult independence or my own career. And so by the time he was probably around turning one or so, I was like, I got to do something for myself. And I had found meditation in college. I had found yoga in college. And I remember very distinctly having a, a conversation with a close friend of mine at the time saying, well, what, what can I do? Because I don't, I don't really want to leave my baby for a lot of hours. I want to, I want to be a stay at home or mostly stay at home parent, but I got to do something. And we kind of just connected the dots. And he said, well, go get your yoga teacher training. And then you know, if you're, if you're accountable for teaching, then you'll be accountable for your own, your, your own practice. So you'll bring that back for yourself. You'll be able to get out a little bit. And I was like, that's perfect because I was able to go teach a, a couple of classes a week, still mostly be home. And it did exactly that. Cause you know, I don't know if anybody's had this experience before, but when my kiddo was an infant and you know, I'd put the baby down to try to 
try to do my yoga practice, baby would scream, pick the baby up, can't do my sun salutations, put the baby down, baby would scream, <laughs> pick the baby up, can't do my, you know, and it just, it was, I was getting really frazzled. So that was a, it was a great entry point to um, start, start to bring myself back. And I loved teaching. I really, I loved teaching yoga. I did exactly that for many years. And then fast forward uh, a second kiddo later, I kind of had a, an awakening moment realizing that the last many years were pretty dark, that I had been in an abusive marriage and it was time to go. <laughs> it was it was really um, a, a, a pretty massive turning point. And so it was, and it was a, an abrupt one as well. And I found myself in a place where I needed to take care of my two kiddos all by myself and keep the house and keep food on the table. And it was at that time, around that time, I was given the opportunity to kind of an, inherit a personal training clientele. I lived in a small town up in the, the Northeast U.S. at the time. And a, a trainer at the gym where I taught yoga was leaving. And they said, well, if you go get your personal training certification, you know, we'll, we'll offer this person's clients to stay on with you. And I was not a gym junkie. I was not a fitness fanatic at the time. In fact, kind of coming from the, the meditation and yoga space and teaching in the gym, I looked like beyond my yoga room and I was like, I don't know what you guys are doing out there, but it looks like it hurts. <laughs> it looks like it's, it's kind of, you know, very stressful. You guys all come into my yoga class with, you know, imbalanced muscles and torn apart joints. And it felt very ego driven. Um, but it was also an offer I couldn't refuse. I needed more bookable hours at the time. And that opportunity ended up being very direction changing for me, not just professionally, but personally. I found myself practicing these, what were foreign to me, uh, body practices, these, these fitness moves. And I remember kind of hiding in this like upstairs corner of the gym because I felt ridiculous, little like yogi me lifting weights. And so I needed to be very private about it. I was also in this really hard time in my life and um, being kind of exposed and vulnerable. I, I needed I needed a lot of kind of personal protection and space. So it's practicing these fitness moves. And I remember this one moment that things kind of just combusted. I was lifting these weights and granted, they were not heavy. I'm a skinny little string bean. And I just had this like boom feeling of, oh my gosh, I feel strong. And that was something, you know, we were talking before hitting record, like I'm tenacious, I'm stubborn, I'm gritty, I'm persistent, I persevere. I have a lot of those kind of um, <clears throat> strong qualities, but that was, the, it was a time in my life I did not feel strong at all. And my, my personal strengths, my inner strength, my sense of self-worth had been one, probably not not fully developed as entering parenthood and a marriage at a very young age. And then what I did have was was really torn apart. And even though I had been telling myself, like, you're strong, you can do this. And my community was saying, oh, you're so strong. I My poor little damaged brain was going, oh, no, you're not. And it, it was replaying all of the, all of the damaging input I had taken on for those, those many years. But in that moment, it was coming from my body. It was coming from a physical experience that I could not deny. I feel strong. And it was like, Ooh, my body, my heart, my brain, everything was congruent and it was undeniable. And it was the sense of relief and ease that I had not felt in, in many years. And I was like, well, this is really cool, but let me go develop this part of my career so I can you know, keep my, keep my house, feed my kids, get, you know, get, get this personal training gig up and running, uh, which really went well. I, I ended up loving it. I ended up uh, being able to teach people things in fitness that they weren't really learning things. I, I borrowed from the, the yoga teaching, like 
alignment and presence and breathing and really feeling like you're inhabiting your body. And it was, it was well received. And I was like, Oh, I can, this is, <laughs> I can do this. Like fitness isn't this big, scary place. This is, this is awesome. But I did end up eventually a few years later going back to school to get my, my master's degree. Cause I wanted to study what happened in that, that combustion moment that kind of, I guess I, I would describe it flipping the mind body angle upside down. I wanted to know what happened when you went body mind and, and not to negate the, the mind body angle. I just wanted to say, well, what does it look like the other way around and really discovering how much that yeah, how much your body can inform kind of up through your nervous system, through your emotional health, into your mental health and your neuro pathways. There is so much power behind that. So for the last 10 years or so, that's the work I've been doing with embodied movement, kind of taking people. I've, I've created a, a methodology around that, kind of figured figured out some nuts and bolts there and taking individual people through their own kind of transformation around that using movement to affect and, and make some deep changes and how the nervous system reacts, how your emotional patterns flow, and ultimately those those neuro pathways. And then most recently, the, the exciting thing I'm up to now is uh, I've developed a personal or a professional training program around that to teach that methodology to wellness professionals who want to integrate somatics, who want to learn that that body piece to integrate with the work that they do, like for for therapists, health coaches, mindset coaches, nutritionists, that kind of thing. And that's where wow. I am today. <laughs> wow. Um what a I don't story. Know where to start. <laughs> yeah, what a story. And and <laughs> you know, I appreciate you hearing your story because um there's a lot of questions I have. But I want to say this. What resonated for me the the most was um um I used to believe in one thing. Uh, I grew up fat, overweight low self-esteem, low confidence, you know, I was in sixth grade, 11 to 12 years old, already 25 pounds. And, you know, I was called, my first name was Ronald. So I was called Ronald McDonald, fat boy. And you can imagine, I hated Ronald. So I talked to help people call me Ronnie. So, you know, battling weight issues and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, I coined this phrase in my mind that if I make my body stronger, my mind will become stronger. So I spent years, I mean, I'm from, let's say, I uh, use a point from 25 to about maybe two years ago, or one year ago, so 25 to like, say, 36, I spent my time focusing my body. It means competing bodybuilding shows. That means taking steroids. That means taking um, weight loss pills. That means going all out because the idea is if I achieve this greatness in my body, I'll be happy. What I figured out about a year and a half ago um, is that I wasn't really happy because my mind wasn't powerful enough um, to get me to the next step, right? So when I studied psychology, I realized the conscious controls the mind, the mind controls the body. So I was so much focused on making the body strong, I wasn't happy. Like, I just wasn't there. It was always defleeting. It was always not there. So what do you think about that? Oh, Ron, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts there. And first of all, I am so sorry that you got caught called that as a kid. I just, I, I'll, I'll circle, I'll, I'll bring this for a circle, but full circle. But one of the things I really believe is that this, so this term I'm, I have used, I will probably use a few more times in this conversation is embodiment. And that's, that's really what I'm going to, to bring it to. And what I mean by embodiment is kind of the congruence between your physical sense of self, your emotional sense of self, your psychological sense of self, maybe even your energetic or spiritual sense of self. And so what I just heard in your story was you kind of separated out, you had this emotional impact from, from your experience as a kid and the name calling and anything else that might have gone on with that, that you kind of said, well, that doesn't work. So mm -hmm. I'm going to turn over here to my physical sense of self because I have some control there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the problem I see is that you separated them. And I think sometimes that's necessary, right? If, if there's a lot of damage in one category, 
in order to kind of get the gears turning in a positive direction. We kind of have to pull ourselves back a little bit in order to make some positive changes. So, you know, that's, I think that's okay, but that separation. So to put that back in, in through my lens is disembodiment. You actually kind of removed yourself from your whole sense of self because that emotional impact from, from all of the, the name calling, you're like, this does not, this is, this is not the me I want to live. That's, that was a disembodying experience. And what's awesome though, in what I just heard in your story was you're, you've been now for, you know, a year, year and a half or whatever at this time of bringing it back together. This, this remembering, I love that word remember, because, you know, as if we're, you know, you and I both have a, a background in fitness, you know, these, this, this, you're the dismembering <laughs> of your body, right? <laughs> so like remembering, um, bringing these elements of, of yourself back together. You know, you've had some, some growth, some, some learning along the way. And I think that that's really what, what we all need to be given the spaciousness, the safety, the tools, the support to do. And, you know, honestly, I think that, that that's, this is what we should be teaching to kids in school. Maybe this is what our, our physical education classes should include, right? Is this, this, what is your sense of health and self? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not just being able to climb the rope or can you reach your toes, but what, what languaging are we using about our bodies? How are we talking to other people about their bodies? Because those things, they, they put up those, those trauma responses, those, those stress responses and those create a programming that can last for a really, mm -hmm. really long time. And I look at what we can do with our physical practices. We can either, and look, I this is one of the reasons I kind of had a, a bad perception of fitness in the beginning is I looked at it as a place to reinforce that separation. I saw a lot of people just kind of coming, coming to the gym to push, mm -hmm. to force that mm -hmm. whole, you know, no pain, no gain attitude. And what I ended up seeing, because I was looking through my, my yogi goggles, was it looked to me like people were putting up these barricades through building muscle or through building, you know, these, these fitness habits to barricades to these other components of, of their sense, their whole sense of self. And I look at movement and physical movement, whatever it is, whether it's exercise, dance, the walks around your neighborhood, your, your posture habits at, at home, at work, at the car. I look at that. It can be an opportunity to put up those barricades or to integrate all of those sense of the, those aspects and elements of yourself. And it could be, it could be one or the other. Sometimes we don't even know, right. We're not given the awareness that that's even a thing. It, we're not taught that. Um, and then two, if we do have the awareness, we're not taught how to make that switch from reinforcing those, those barricades to safely dismantling them, gently dismantling them and uh, helping that integration. You know what? You gave a really good explanation of exactly how I feel now is, um, you know, I call it the path least resistance. If I follow one path, let's say to make my mind strong and it wasn't working or giving me the satisfaction I wanted, okay, we switch gears and find another path. Let's say the path for me was fitness to make my body stronger because it will provide me a value, right? So in the value I didn't tell earlier was that my value and my belief system was if my body looks a certain way, thus I will be able to get the car, get the money, and get the girl. Because mm. all of those have a had a value to me. So my idea is, okay, so this is a, le the, a lever for the trigger. So let me work my body, do anything I can, because then I'll be popular, then I'll get the car, then I'll get the girl, and thus I'll be happy. That that was 
as simple as you get it was that thought process up until I had an awakening moment and I had a fracturing point about two years ago. Um, actually, sorry, three years ago, I had a fracturing point when I woke up and realized I got to do something different. This shit ain't working. Mm -hmm. And I did something completely different. I really just started listening to my intuition and started listening to what I really want instead of, so it's, it came down to this. I started realizing two things. Um, there's a difference between being and doing. And I was doing, not being. Second thing being is that I walked through my life as though I was the effect of my reality, not the cause. So when I switched those things around, realized, wait a minute, I'm the cause of X, Y, Z, whatever it is. And I'm going to do focus on uh, uh, being, not doing, life changed. It just, mm. it just overnight, just, I mean, not overnight, you know, time does fly, but I realized that it changed for me and a uh, holistic, uh, a happy process. If that didn't happen, Life of Shuffle wouldn't be here with Gloria and I, because I would still be focused on training. I would be a life coach helping clients. It's just, you know, um, there's a, there's always breadcrumbs along the way when you're going through a journey and a restructuring, you lose friends, family members, people along the way help guide you by the words of encouragement. Um, one guy told me without taking risk, I've never, ever, never know success. In addition, I had a client of mine that when he poured his heart out to me after winning a competition the first time, I knew then, right then and there, why I never won, because I wasn't supposed to be there. It energetically felt that way, and that's what happened. So, yeah, thank you for explaining it to me, and man, this is this is awesome. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Now, you talk about like having an awakening, right? So, it's a lot, everyone will have that kind of awakening that we all do. Or maybe they will, and then that will come later on. Then, Jesse, you talked about, you know, teaching someone to have that kind of awareness. Because then we end up being in that autopilot, uh, the thought of, okay, I got to do this. I got to build muscle. And, like, with Ron, it's because I need to attract, you know, it's his way of attracting women. Um, how do you teach somebody that to let that go? and be and have that certain awareness that's a really good question gloria and i i want to kind of make a point that those those awakening moments can really cross a, a, a broad spectrum everything from like a little teeny glimmer of you know what i just want something different or i want to make an improvement in this kind of life Some, something that's a little more gentle and inspirational all the way up to, uh, you know, Ron, I love that term, that fracturing point of, you know, intensity. I, I, I've walked an intense path. I'm, I'm seeking now in my, I'm oh, quote unquote over the hill now, and I'm seeking more, more gentle awakenings in this chapter <laughs> of my life because the awakenings <laughs> I've had have been more intense. Um, but I think that it is important to note that because it can feel very different to kind of have a, a, a kind of gentle, quiet, inspirational awakening versus an intense, possibly fracturing awakening. And it, when I was just listening to you and how you kind of approached that question, the, a quote kind of came to my mind. You guys might have heard that the body speaks in whispers before it speaks in screams. and the when i am either helping somebody kind of awaken their own awareness to these signals in their body so that they can learn to kind of access them once they've accessed them decode them i i think of the body's language is in sensation so learning to awaken sensation learning to read or decode that language of sensation and then learning to respond accurately or in alignment with that sensation. And something that happens when you are kind of on the more intense end of the spectrum moving towards a breaking point or a fracturing point, you can desensitize. If you are especially if you are dealing with trauma or, or an intense stress response, 
your your biology is meant to draw your attention away from anything that's not necessary to in in order to promote your either just protection or survival. So I I say that because I know it, in the beginning of my own kind of reawakening and teaching myself that level of, of awareness, I felt a lot of regret and guilt that why didn't I see this before? Why didn't I feel this before? Why didn't I respond better earlier? And you know, now that I'm a little further out and and because I'm a nerd and have studied this <laughs> big time, I kind of know know the inner workings of this, but that's that's just how it goes. And so one of the ways I teach that is to first kind of do some nervous system regulation. You can't have access to the awareness of the wisdom of your body and and read those signals to to be able to respond in alignment with them if you are just freaking out. <laughs> if you are, you know, if if you have your guards up or if you have all of your your protective barriers up. And sometimes those those are in place for a reason. Those are in place because you are in a situation that is not right for you. And it could be anything is like, I'm just in the wrong job for a long time, or I've been listening to a negative boss for a long time, or, you know, everything to, to something that that's really detrimental and damaging or something that's just like, oh, I'm just, I don't feel like me. You know, it could look a lot of different ways. So the first thing is in in teaching that is to really create the the body as an environment where these signals can light up. I can picture it like a switchboard lighting up. So that would be things like one of my favorite tools is breath work because it's I, I look at breath as kind of the bridge between your physical sense of self and your mental and emotional sense of self. Because think about it, when when you're, every emotion kind of has its own breath. If you are laughing and joyful, that has its own breath that goes with it. If if something startles you and you're afraid that, <gasps> that, that gasp and kind of a short, shortness of breath. If you are in a deeply pleasurable moment, that long, slow, drawn out breath. So you, and breath is something you can control. So it's something that kind of happens to you. If a situation changes your state, your breath will be one of the first things to change. But when, kind of like when I said in the beginning, what happens when you flip that body to mind thing upside down, you can change your breath to change your state. So that's the first thing I started really doing when I realized I was stuck in survival mode, when I was stuck in fight, flight, freeze, bond, faint mode is, thank goodness I had my yoga training. I was like, what can, there's a lot I felt like I couldn't do. What can I do? I can intentionally breathe. And even if it was, and it was for very short amounts of time in the beginning, because I was afraid and I was really, really stuck in that mode. So sometimes, you know, in teaching other people to do that, it, it's just the little teeny tiny bits you can do. And just like you can train a muscle to be stronger, you can train your nervous system to respond to these breaths that correlate with regulation, that correlate with calm. And when you can do that, you then light up that switchboard, you then gain access to this, this body wisdom, and then are able to kind of get that get that information that allows you to make those integrative moves. Like, you know, and like Ron said, like, oh, this isn't working. <laughs> like <laughs> my, my mental, my mental strength and my physical strength, these are not coordinating here. Um, and that's a way you can kind of find where, where the things that aren't coordinating, where the gaps are and start to, to bring them together. So it's just really, <clears throat> this is really more like, I'm thinking about this. It's just connecting your mind and your body. You find that, you find that way or that path, how to connect both. Yeah. I, I heard a friend of mine describe it this way recently. And since then I've, I've been using this, but 
using a lot of people when you're thinking of connecting mind and body, we are coming off I, from I mean, being in, in this field for a long time, we're coming off a generation of mindfulness. You know, mindfulness, maybe 10, 20 years ago was a newer, less used term. You know, some weirdos like me found meditation in college or, you know, like the, it was. But now we see mindfulness everywhere. You know, they, we have mindfulness challenges from Oprah and Deepak Chopra. We have mindfulness in the schools. Um, I have a when my my younger son is in high school and when they went to hybrid education last year when the the schools closed you know we there was a a meeting with the teachers and this one the i think it was the english teacher said you know if you see your kids sitting in front of their their chromebook with their eyes closed don't automatically assume that they're sleeping through class i do a mindfulness moment at the beginning of every class and we do a little you know check in and so i you know mindfulness a lot of times when we think about connecting the mind and body, we think about it because this has been the conversation for the last many years of coming in through the mind. So what I'm offering here is, yes, and what if the, the, the body, what's, what sometimes happens when you come in through that mindfulness? Like I looked at coming in through my mindfulness and I was thinking, okay, I know how to meditate. I know how to think positively. I know how to keep planning and putting one foot in front of the other, but my body was operating in survival mode. My nervous system was freaking out and it was not allowing me to feel calm and to feel safe. And I couldn't flip that switch with my mindfulness techniques. I just couldn't. My brain, my neuro pathways were stuck. They were just stuck. And those, those mindful skill, mindfulness skills weren't budging them. So this is really, this conversation is really just about coming in from the other angle, coming in through the body angle to do that. My, yes, it is, you know, to your point, connecting the mind and body. It's just opening up, turning the arrow the other direction and opening up that pathway as a possibility. So using movement, using physical skills to change those neuro pathways, to connect the, the mind and body, but from the body pathway. Wow. I like that. I like I that like because we're so, um, yeah, I think what we know is we only know one or the other, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. so we only know mindfulness. We focus on just mindfulness. So we meditate. Then we know physical, so we focus on working out. We focus on just anything physical in our body. But we never really think about how do you connect both and how do you do both at the same time? Or how are, how is both connected? Right, right. Yeah. And it's really beautiful when you do, you know, that. that's where I see that that's embodiment. That's our, that's our whole sense of self. And, you know, Working with mindfulness, we've we've discovered, oh my gosh, our body stores our history. Mm -hmm. Working with mindfulness, we've kind of shown the flashlight into this inner world of somatics and where you know how how the body responds to trauma, how the body stores emotional stories. And so it really is, you know, I think I a term I keep saying is embodiment is the new mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, it really gives me so much excitement and enthusiasm and hope and just that it's wonderful to see people. It's, it's a relief. It's refreshing to say, oh gosh, all of this, all of this mindfulness, because mind, mindfulness training can be hard <laughs> and arduous. And when you connect the dots and add in this this embodiment piece, it, it almost like activates it and puts it in action and brings those pieces together. It, you know, Ron, what you said, the, the being and doing, it, it becomes not either or, but both together. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you talked about um, <clears throat> as a yoga instructor and, um, and I do yoga and I think I've discussed this with you, how I do Bikram, uh, Bikram yoga. A lot of the people I've heard are there for mindfulness and a lot they're there to 
um, for injuries, prevent injuries or whatever previous injuries that they've had. Now I go and I'm thinking about it and I go there in the beginning when I first started Bikram Yoga, it's because of my injuries and I've heard about it and I said, let me try that. And I've had and seen the difference um, without having to do surgery. I've gone through um, without having to do surgery on my knee. I was able to go back into my regular activities with the help of Bikram Yoga and other strengthening that I had to do. Now, would you say, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't yoga be not only physical and also mindfulness when you're in there? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think that that's what allowed me to see fitness the way that I saw it in the beginning, because I came in from, from that yoga approach. You know, was, I, I first learned yoga myself as a, as a student and then as an instructor. And I have seen that time and time again in, in the yoga room where whatever got the person in there, whether it was, oh, I've heard stretching is good, or I need to de-stress, or I, I have this injury and somebody said, you know, yoga is a good idea. What, whatever got you in the door, if it is done well, and, you know, the, all the different lineages or types of yoga out there, you know, if, if it is done well, then it is absolutely the potential to create that environment where the embodiment and the mindfulness can come together. I think that having that experience is what gave me the perspective that that's a possibility. And with, with the work that I do in embodied movement, my suggestion is that you can create that kind of combination in any type of movement. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm listening to your story and I have two questions. Uh, first, I want to know what was your, fra what was your fracturing point? And, um, you know, in, in my field, I do a lot of engineers and a lot of people like uh, the old saying is uh, if, if I see it, seeing is believing. So if it's tangible, they can see it and believe it. So, how would you tell someone that has that mindset of seeing is believing to merge them two together without giving them two tangible items in their hand? Uh, so, I mean, for me personally, my fracturing point, I, I had a moment, my youngest son, my kids are about five years apart. My youngest son was less than a year old. Mm -hmm. And a, a series of events had been going on, um, really kind of painful, scary things. And they were kind of increasing in frequency, increasing in intensity. And so I was kind of on, on high alert of recognizing that the, the situation that I had been able to kind of grit my way through was different. I, I started recognizing, you know, kind of like a, a you know, I think this is very primal, right? I, my two little kids, one of them was a baby and I'm like looking around, like the scene is not safe kind of thing. <laughs> and there was just, there was one of those, one of those moments where there was an incident in my home that was very unsafe. And it tipped my scales. And I left my house and I walked away with my five year old and my baby. And I said, I'm not coming back until you are gone. And it was just this, this kind of point of no return feeling inside of I have been tested to the max. There is nowhere else to go. There are no other fragments left to explore except a complete turn of this situation. So I would say my, my fracturing moment in that case was very primal. I, I'm going to add a, a second part, because I think these are kind of two bookends. 
I think that that started me into a holding pattern of sorts where I had fractured into enough pieces that when I looked at all of the pieces, every single one of them was was broken way too small except one. And that one was, get the hell out. So I picked up that one piece and got the hell out. But that put me then in a holding pattern of that was all I could do, just get through the next day and the next day and the next day. And there was kind of a a coming together point. And this is a little less pinpointed, but if you're looking at kind of the, the, the two tangible things, right, that was, that was very vivid to me when you, you put it together that way. I think for some people, fracturing moments are complex. They're not necessarily kind of one pointed. And there was another kind of less pinpointed point where I realized, okay, I have to, this, this one shard (laughs) that I left with is not sustainable to live on Mm -hmm. long-term. And I need to rebuild. And those other pieces are too shattered. I cannot use them. And so I had to start to look around at what I could pull from. And so I, I consider this a fracturing moment as well, because I, w- I had kind of gained enough space from that initial kind of more traumatic fracturing moment where all I could do was pick up that one shard that said, get the hell out and go. Now I had a little bit more bandwidth to kind of look around and see, okay, the coast is clear. And I don't know how much long, how, what the timeline was from that first moment, but let's say at least at least six months or so, I'm guessing, and enough bandwidth to look around and say, oh, it's a little calmer now. The danger has passed, but things are really broken. I can't go on on this one shard because this, I'm ex- like running on fumes, ex- like this, this is not going to work. What can I rebuild with? And I started looking at what was working and, and maybe it's my nature, maybe it's, it's my training but I started looking around and I found my health habits. Mm. I found hydration. <laughs> I found <laughs> nutrition. I, I lived uh, up on a mountain at that time. I found like, grounding, like putting my feet on the earth. I found um, different techniques of uh, one was just really looking on purpose for beautiful things, simple things like the way the sunlight came in through the window or the particular color of a flower or a raindrop on a piece of grass, like very simple things. And like when I would notice them, I would make myself linger on that Mm. for a moment. And so all of, so I I started found finding all of these pieces. So it was still fracturing because they were also pieces But it was a point where I started to be able to kind of notice pieces that I could start putting together to rebuild. Wow. So essentially. That's beautiful. Yeah. And it's powerful too, because essentially is a human nature fight or flight. So obviously some situation you went through, you had to say, I got to get the heck out of here. And then it's apparent that the way to put yourself back together is to connect with your environment. Mm -hmm. So as you tend to. Um, let's say as you tend to give out to others or you tend to go through these ma- these moments that are traumatic, let's say events, it's important to get back to basics, run your, run your feet through grass, smelling the fresh air, uh, maybe hiking, drinking water. So that way you can probably bring the pieces back together and see how to, um, see how to move forward. Cause as you say, you're in a holding pattern, like what to do, where to go, what's the best option, right? Mm-hmm. Or let me ask you this. What is in your definition of a holding pattern? Um, I I look at it as a very both physical and psychological thing. Where so because I this is how I look at these things. So neurons that fire together 
wire together. When you have a pattern, whether it is a thought pattern, a life pattern, we are, we are as humans created to run on habits. Otherwise, you know, if I, if I reach out to, to pick up my glass of water, if I had to think about every little step, like, okay, core has to engage to keep my trunk stable, you know, tricep has to engage to extend my arm, forearm muscles have to engage to grip the glass, you know, like that all happens below my level of consciousness. So I look at a holding pattern as you have had something impact and your your way of being to create a pattern. And that pattern then sinks below your level of consciousness. So if I want to change the holding pattern, I have to bring it up to my level of consciousness. That's where changes can be made. But I think a holding pattern, whether that is your thinking patterns, your do, the being and doing, let's just bring it back to that, whether it is a being pattern or a doing pattern, it is something that has been informed by either a chronic situation or an intense situation, created a set of habits in being and doing, and has sunk below your level of consciousness. So it just happens. Gloria, like you said, running on autopilot. Mm. Wow. So it's basically just getting back to basics and figure out the steps, bring it to your higher level of conscious or awareness, and so that we can proceed forward. Yeah. And your nervous system is really cool because it has these kind of switch tracks mm-hmm. where you can take something that has sunk below the level of your conscious awareness and bring it up. And I mean, you can even like trace like the, the, the pathways that these, these ner- that your nervous system fires will, will alter. You can bring it up to the level of consciousness where you can change the pattern. And then once that new pattern has established, it will sink again below the level of conscious awareness. That's, that's a switch track that you have control over. And that's where creating an environment where that can happen becomes key. So, you know, those back to basics things or like Gloria, what you experienced in the Bikram yoga class, like there are lots of different ways to create that environment so that you can find that juncture so that you can cross things above and below that level of consciousness to change them. Yeah. So it's just, it's more of like connecting to your highest self as well. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and how was that? What, what does it, what does that feel like for you to be connected to your higher self? Oh, I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like, so I, right now, you know, as we're recording this, I'm 43 and I asked me that in a few years because I feel like I'm finally just at that point where I'm like, Oh, wow. All right. My my twenties, you know, this went went down that path. A lot of this is, is was the story of my twenties. My my thirties was really about getting my feet back on the ground, living into that that stability that I created, but not really flourishing. I guess like I I was good, I was good, but still really like doing the do, like just. Uh-huh. Build, re, you know, in that rebuilding phase, and now in my forties, I think that's the question mm-hmm. that, or that's that's the journey right now. The the inquiry that I'm on, the the the, I think that's exactly what I've bring up to my level of consciousness is okay. Now that I've done this part and that part and this other part, I think I've got the ingredients to live into my higher self. And I'm sure I borrowed some intelligence. I'm sure that my higher self was like, Oh, little Jesse, <laughs> get up. <laughs> like it was probably the thing that when, when I woke up that day and said, get the hell out, that was probably a message from my higher self, right? Some of these pieces when I was able to look around and finally like see the beauty of, of something in nature instead of really being stressed out and, and afraid, like that was probably a little, a little poke, a little nudge from my, from my higher self, the, the inspiration to go study this stuff. It, this, this feels like a calling for me. This feels like purpose work for me. I'm, I feel so blessed 
to have my work be an integration of, of both personal and professional. I don't know what it is to separate mm -hmm. those things, you know, to, to go to a job that I'm not aligned with and then come home and, and then that's where, where I'm myself, you know, all of these things I think are influences from my higher self. And I can tell you, I'm really excited about this decade and beyond to, to really figure out the answer to that question. So we'll, we'll have to do another recording in a few years. We can start uh, yeah, with that question. Yeah, of course we will. I think we do. <laughs> yeah. I think we should. And I love that. I love the feeling of when you feel like you have that calling and you feel like this is a calling or the thought of, what is this? What does this mean? I think this is it. I think this is a calling. And you just kind of move forward and you try to, and you go and pursue that. Once you mm -hmm. do, it just kind of, everything just kind of falls in place. You know, and um, and what was, if any, message, any message you received from this? I, that's a really, another really good question. And I, I think the, the biggest thing that I, I kind of surround this whole conversation with and, and the thing I really want to make sure I, I kind of leave with here and one of my biggest messages is where I really believe as humans on this, this healing journey, this growth journey, we are not meant to do it alone. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we are coming off just like we're coming off of a generation of learning mindfulness. I also see that we are coming off of a generation of self care, self empowerment, you know, individual, you know, self awareness. And I think that's an essential component. A lot of us and myself included lost our sense of selves. We lost that piece. We we are either givers or we've we've given into, you know, like Ron, you said, like the idea of like get the car, get the girl, you know, like we've mm -hmm, we've mm -hmm. lost that that inner sense of self. But I truly believe that the smallest component of health is we, is togetherness, mm -hmm. and that 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 growth journey, the healing journey, is is not an individual journey. It has an individual component for sure. Um, but when, when you, you know, for myself, the, one of the, the biggest things that I had the hardest time leaning into, and I, I see a lot in my communities is when you're so stuck on this, I gotta, I gotta fix myself. I gotta heal myself. I gotta change something about myself you lose that interconnection with others. And especially if, if it, if a connection with others helped influence that, that needing to retreat within, you know, if there was some sort of traumatic situation brought on by another person or group of people that, that can influence a lack of, of trust, a lack of opening up a lack of vulnerability, which is completely understandable but I think that, you know, my, my hope is that the way that coaching, that healthcare, that the healing arts, that, that communities in general can improve is in the sense of togetherness. I, I want there to be not just a self-help section, but a help each other section. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in you know in the bookstores in our you know in <laughs> our agree. in the you know all of that so i think that's that's one of my biggest lessons and and my biggest inspirations like if i could shout something from the rooftops right now it's it's that is that we we've got to be in this together and that that healing and growing is not meant to be done alone mm. Yes, exactly. And that's what we're here for. That's what this podcast is about as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I read this book. I sorry, I read, listen to this book when I was listening on audibles. And um, it's by five different people. It's by Earl Nightingale. It was um, Jim Romans in there. Tony Robbins was in there. It was like a three hour long book. And um, one author said, um, everybody in this universe and the world has... Um, I think of an orchestra. You got a you got a banjo, you got a flute, you got whatever it is. Everybody needs to play their own drum. And obviously in the orchestra, everybody plays their own drum because it brings everybody together. And no one does nothing alone. You can't have an orchestra or event or an opera show without everybody helping each other out, right? 
this person is good at singing, this person is good at propping, whatever it may be. We collectively need to work together. Instead, collectively, we learn to be separate. So while we intentionally pursue happiness or pursue success or whatever it is, we think it's all individual. You know, easy example is if a person has a master's degree. The kindergarten teacher had to teach him how to do, uh, how to teach how to color, right? So they didn't do that alone. They wouldn't know how to color. Some, some teacher in second grade had to teach him two plus two, whatever it is. So no one does nothing alone, but we think we're alone, but we're not. And also hearing your story, uh, Jesse, too, is a last little piece. Because for me, as I'm getting older, I, I just turned 38 last month. I'm picking up speed. I'm like the NASCAR. Not a little funny car to back up. And now it goes red, green, uh, red, yellow, green, hit the gas, and they fly down a straightaway. That's me. I'm picking up speed. Mm-hmm. So what I want to actually get to the point is that um, we have to give ourselves permission to be us, but be you, or be an individual, or not individual, but Permission to be who you are rather than just using outside sources to define who you are, become your identity. Because what happens, you we go through a fracturing point, you're realizing, wait a minute, I was known as this, whatever the identity is. Now I'm going to create a new one. How do I do it? And I have my certain environment, circumstances. Can I do it? You know, so give myself permission. And like you said, get that bookstore um, or Amazon, whatever it is, and create the icon that says, bring us together and how. I might write yes. That. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Cause I think that's the only way we will truly have permission. Like if it's just little old me in a vacuum going like, okay, I, I can do this. I have permission to be me, but then you walk out the door and the whole world is going, Oh, but not that way. Oh, not that way. It's but this not way. That way. Exactly. Not that, and that's, that, right? and that's so, when you start looking down and looking down at yourself. And you don't move. Yes. You don't move and forward. You don't yeah. Yeah. You end up going back into your comfort zone because someone said no. And, but right. then president said, no, has no idea your journey, your path, your direction, what you want to do. And more importantly, we get learned how to ask more questions. Mm-hmm. Don't Just mind be curious me, of don't others, say. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Be more curious of other people. Be more curious of me. Ask me questions. Don't judge. Yes. Yes. So one thing, Jesse, um, as we get ready to end our podcast and the time flies, what is... I always ask clients at the not clients, sorry. I, I work full time as a coach. I always always work clients, our guests. Um, we always ask our guests, what is one thing, be one to three sentences long, that someone can have as a big takeaway from you? Uh, all right. First of all, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love I just I think, you know, we we don't hear that enough. Um I, Thank you. Thank you. And and I love you. And say that to somebody today um, and say that to yourself, even if that's that's goofy. So first of all, just love. I just I just want to surround this this whole conversation and love and to take love away is hard times right now. And we just let's, let's put that little dose in in your love tank. But the 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 actionable takeaway I will leave with is just know that your body is wise. Know that there, you know, sometimes the the signals can go haywire. Sometimes your, your body is operating on old stories. Mm -hmm. It can be, it can be shifted. It can, it can happen gently. It can happen powerfully, but your, your body is wise. I love that. I love that. I'm going to write down right now how (laughs) to operate on new stories. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse. And I really, really appreciate that. Of course. Thank you guys for, for holding these, these conversations and, and broadcasting this message and for all that, that you do. We need more of this. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you. So thank you. I want to say thanks, Jesse, for being a guest and for our listeners out there listening to podcasts. Jesse, where can they find you if they want to connect with you? Absolutely. Embodiedmovementtraining.com is my website. It's a long URL, embodiedmovementtraining.com. And you will see all of my goodies there. And there's a contact form. I love hearing other people's stories. So please, I, I read every single email individually. I would love to, to hear from you if you heard something that really stood out. 
I would love to hear what that is. So embodiedmovementtraining.com. Awesome. We better connect her. So guys, you know where to find her, you know where to connect. And she reads every single story. So it's not a bot responding or some virtual assistant. It's Jesse responding to your story. So connect with real authentic people. Yes. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. This is Ron Johnson, your life coach and mindset coach. Yes. And again, thanks, Jesse, for um, joining us today and just um, for sharing your story. And we appreciate you. And again, thank you for um, listening to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. And just one last thing, just be about love and be love.